Hallelujah. God bless Brother Spurlock. Uh, we get distracted by things. Some of us get distracted by sickness. We get stri- distracted by golf. We get distracted by all sort of fishing. We get distracted by exercise. We get distracted. 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 Come to church, it's time to focus. You get so distracted, you don't want to come to church. You get distracted, you don't want to listen. You get distracted. If you're distracted tonight, I know some of you are, just stop and listen. Let's just talk about the Lord for a few minutes. It won't cost you for for a few. And uh, some of you are distracted by problems. Some of you are distracted by opportunity. But let's just, for a few minutes, let's set the distraction aside. This is a holy place. And let's dig in a little bit. I was <clears throat> having a discussion today about the Sabbath. And I uh, don't want to teach on it or preach on it, but Jesus was in the tomb on the Sabbath. But he was alive on the first day of the week. And I'm not hung up on days you can have church. You can have church Tuesday night at 11 o'clock and it's still church. Jesus is the Sabbath rest. But every Sunday morning is resurrection day because he rose on the first day of the week. So don't get hung up on. I've been talking to people all day that are hung up on stuff. I I do believe we need to. And we're going to talk about holiness tonight. That's what we're going to talk about. But. I want to get hung up on Jesus and what he did. He didn't came, he did not come to destroy the law but to fulfill it. And every Sunday is resurrection day. We're going to celebrate Easter, which is not even a Christian word. I don't want to go on that, but we're going to call it resurrection day. We're going to celebrate it in 3 weeks. And I'm glad um, we're going to celebrate it. And it's going to be a great day. We're going to have children singing and young people singing and old people singing and Joan singing. Young people singing. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be the biggest crowd of the year. It's going to be a great time. We're going to have have five or 10,000 Easter eggs to hunt. If you like, want to do that. Whatever you want to do, we can do it. And, uh, some of you are going to be wearing purple, green, and pink suits. It's going to be that kind of day. I'm going to wear a purple suit with green socks and a pink tie. That's, no, I'm really not. It's going to be that kind of day. You're going to wear your best duds. You're going to come. You're going to have a good time. We're going to have people taking pictures. Everybody's going to get a family photo in 8 by 10, no charge. We're going to serve refreshments in the foyer to all our guests as they come in. And so so you can crush those powdered donuts in the pew when you come in here. We're going to, whatever we, but we're going to, we just can't lose focus on the, I've been talking to people that are even sidetracked by unnecessary things. Even if they're scriptural, some things are more important than others. There are some things in the body that we cannot touch, but there are other things. You can eat a lot of salt before it kills you, but you can have one drop of strychnine and be dead. But they both kill you. It's a matter of dosage. There are some things that are lawful, but some things that are not expedient. There are some things you shouldn't do, but there are some things that you absolutely cannot do. Am I talking to anybody? And we get sidetracked by things. The Pharisees were sidetracked. They were the most religious people in the world, but would you say they're sidetracked? They crucified him. So let's focus on Jesus. What do you say? Can I, can we do that? Because we are the Israel of the New Testament. We are But this is not the first day of the week, nor the last day of the week. This is not the Sabbath, nor is it Sunday. This is Wednesday. And I still think the Lord can move today. What do you say? Let's get in the Word, Exodus chapter 33, verse number 7. Moses took his tent. (coughs) What do you do with it? He got away from everybody. And he he pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp. 
He couldn't hear anybody. He couldn't see anybody. He didn't know what was going on. He unplugged his TV. He turned off his cell phone. And he pitched that tent outside the camp, far away from the camp, and he called it the tabernacle of meeting. Well, if there's nobody out there and it's outside the camp, who are you meeting? Different kind of meeting. Wasn't a poker game. Wasn't a sewing club. And it came to pass that after everyone, <clears throat> he pitched it outside and he called the tabernacle, and it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out. to the ta If you wanted to seek the Lord, you had to get away from everything. Oh, my goodness. Anybody want to seek the Lord? I was preaching Sunday. The Holy Ghost was in the house. The church was full of the power and presence of the Lord. My phone was sitting here, and I got a text message. You're in church. So I left my phone over there as you text me. But we can't even get away from things in a sanctuary. So I want to talk to you tonight about the beginning of holiness. God to say a long ways to go and a short time to get there. He's going to help me say amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. How many people who sought the Lord in that scripture, how many people who sought the Lord went outside the camp? Can you put it back up there, Tim? Who said that? Everybody that sought the Lord went outside the hustle and the bustle, got outside of the noise, got outside of the view of everything that was going on, outside of their comfort zone, outside of their familiarity. They did something different. There's nothing wrong with your comfort zone. But you're never going to find God there. There's nothing wrong with your familiarity with the, the with the daily grind, and you're stuck in it. We're stuck in it. We're all you got to work. You got to make a living. I'm not, <clears throat> but there there are seasons and there are times when you have to go to the tent of meeting. You have to reestablish your relationship with your Creator. Matthew chapter 19. <clears throat> Moses <clears throat> then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. It's a fair question. We've left all. We left our familiarity. We left our comfort zone. We went outside the camp. We followed you. And now, what are you going to do for us? <laughs> That's just the way Peter was. He was trying to make a deal. I, I, I bet you Peter could have sold some rainbow vacuum cleaners. He would have been an Amway guy like nobody's business. He just had that way about him. But he said, Lord, we've left everything. We've gotten outside. We had to do what Moses did. We had to pitch our tent away from everybody else so that we could meet with you. Now what's in it for us? Listen to what Luke said in chapter 14. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That is a very difficult scripture to swallow. Because my question to me, it's not my question to, to you, my question to me is have I sacrificed, have I forsaken all that I have? We love to repent of our sins that we don't like, but we have sins that we like. We don't want to repent of those. We love to repent of our mistakes and our failures. But there are some things that we really enjoy that we ought to repent of. Boy, that's tough preaching. Forsake everything. I don't know if if I've done that. I, 
But he said, if I don't do it, I can't be. I know there are seasons in my life when I've done that. And I really think that's what we're talking about. There are times in your life where you spend a lot of time just going, you've got to make a living. You've got to feed the babies. You've got to take care of mama. You've got to, you got to do what you got to do, especially if you're ahead of your household. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. I've had three jobs and pastored a church before because I had to. Because you, you got to have, you got to have something to eat. You can't pastor a church, but a few weeks without food, you'll, you'll die. So you got to make grocery money. So I've done that because I had to, but then there are times when you have to forsake everything, at least for a season. I don't think that you forsake everything all the time, but I think the Lord says there are times when you go out. You got to go back to the camp sometime. You got to go, but there are times when you leave everything and you go in search of his presence to that tent of meeting. My question is how long has it been since you've been to the tent, tent of meeting? Because you're sidetracked. When you get sidetracked and you catch yourself getting sidetracked, you say, well, I really don't want to go to church. I got other things I need to be doing. Or, man, I'm, I, 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 you ought to go to the tent. We are unconsciously governed by the familiar. We get <coughs> rutted. <coughs> An old sign, I think it's in the Gann Museum in Benton. It was down at Highway Exit 117 where you turn to go to Hot Springs. That was the old Hot Springs Highway. You may know where that's at. There's an old sign. I've seen it somewhere. And it was 23 miles up that road, and that road was was dirt. And it goes up hills and down hills, and it was full of, and there were people that made a living with a team of mules. They would, in those spots where it was muddy and low, that people would get stuck, and they would hire, they'd have to hire somebody with these mules to pull them out. We don't think about that, do we? I got a ticket for doing 105 miles an hour on that road, so the sheriff let me off, but I got pulled over for that. Sheriff's deputy walks up, hands me his cell phone. This really happened. He said, somebody wants to talk to you. And it was the sheriff. And he said, preacher, slow down, and hung up the phone on me. <laughs> Don't tell anybody that. But take that off the tape. <laughs> but people were getting stuck, and so they're pulling them out with mule teams to make a living. People made a living sitting there all day with a team of mules, pulling people out when they got stuck. And there's a sign. At the beginning of Highway 5, and that was, I-30 wasn't there, so it was downtown Benton, like where the old KFC used to be. I think Walgreens is there now. I think that's where it was. It said, choose your rut carefully because you're going to be in it for the next 23 miles. And we get in that rut, and we get stuck in it for miles and miles and days and weeks and years, decades. We get stuck. We never leave the rut to go to the tent of meeting. I need to hire me a mule team to pull me out of my rut and carry me to the tent. Can I get an amen? We must redeem some time. We can't redeem all of our time. Just like you didn't redeem all of your sheep or all of your lambs or you just redeemed the firstborn that's why coming to church on the first day of the week is important we're redeeming the first day so God can bless the rest of the week redeeming the time that's why I think forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together is so important because this sanctuary if we'd leave our cell phones in the car we'd all be, I think we're going to have a leave your cell phone in the car Sunday My God, some people will freak out. You'll act like you're going to the bathroom, but you're going to check Facebook. <clears throat> the 
this Sunday is going to be redeemed that Sunday, Sunday. We're going to leave our cell phones in the car Sunday. I'm like, we're going to make an announcement. Will you all help me? How many of you? Come on, it's a big sacrifice. How many of you leave your car, your cell phone in the car? Sunday, not, not when church starts, you'll leave it in here when you get here. Well, that's good. Some of you won't have a Bible. You have to find a paper Bible. We got lost and found. We'll set the lost and found box. We got dozens and dozens of lost and found Bible been left here over the years. We'll set them out so you have a Bible. But you won't be able to find it because you don't know where the, you just Google. I mean, you don't know how to find. I better leave that alone. Man. Most people, and i got to go fast, and if you don't hear anything else, I say most people, and this eats me alive. A man died today, Mr. McClendon, the CEO, of, former CEO of Chesapeake Energy. They say he was indicted by a federal grand jury yesterday. I don't know if he committed suicide or somebody killed him. I don't know what happened to him. I respected the man. He changed the face of energy. He made energy affordable in America. He reinvented so much. Many, many millions of people have been blessed by him. Thousands and thousands of people have become millionaires all because of this man's efforts and energy. I respected him. Nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. He made some mistakes. But I don't know what happened to him today. It, it really kind of bothered me today all day long. But <clears throat> you put two crabs in a bucket. I preached a sermon years ago called Crabs in a Bucket. This is how I learned this, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I was told I was fishing one February night after preaching on a Sunday night in Victoria, Texas. We went down to the pier at Port O'Connor, and we're fishing for the black drum that run, and these are big, giant fish that pull like a tank, and uh, it is fun. And you take a giant hook, you hook it through a crab, a whole crab that big around, you stick that hook through it, and you launch that out there, and these giant fish... And the, we, you buy crab by the dozen, and you use them for bait. He said, be sure that you keep at least two crabs in that bucket. And I said, why is that? He said, because you cannot keep one crab in a bucket. He'll crawl out. But as long as there's two crabs, right when that one crab's about to crawl out, that other one will reach down and pull him back in. Called being crabby. We hate to see someone else do good. We want to pull them down to our level. We don't want someone else to excel. We want to, we're like crabs in a bucket. Don't you dare get out because I can't get out. And so one crabs. And that's what we do oftentimes, even in church. Instead of lifting him up, instead of lifting each other up and lifting the Lord up, Because most people have no, listen to this, write it down. Most people have no greater goal than to be normal. There's another word for normal, lukewarm. The Lord said it makes me throw up. got to get to the point that normal makes us sick. We've got to get to the point that the rut makes us want to throw up. I'm not getting very many amens, but that's awful good preaching. We've got to get to the point that sometimes we've got to get out of the familiar. We have to go to the tent. We, we, do, we limit our desires by measuring up to somebody else. I got a text from a young man I met in a business meeting or Facebook message, I don't know. We've been messaging back and forth. And he just graduated college. He's wanting to go into the finance industry and he wanting to talk to me and wanting to. <clears throat> and he said, I really want to sit down and talk to you. I want to pick your brain because I want to have what you have. I want to be like you. I'm messaging you back. I said, I'd be careful what I prayed for. And 
we measure, we limit ourselves by, I'd like to be like him, or I'd like to be like her, or I'd like to have that level, or that level, or I just want to be normal. You can't live for God and be normal. We need a vision from God. We need a dream. We need to hitch our wagon to a spiritual star or we will perish in the rut. We got to get out of our comfort zone or we'll die in the rut. <clears throat> First Corinthians 3 and 3. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, crabs in a bucket, are you not carnal? Behaving like mere men. Can I refer? We're behaving like normal people. Because normal people are full of envy, strife, and divisions. Normal people are carnal. But when we come to church, Ros and I had a great meeting a while ago, just a Holy Ghost meeting a while ago. There wasn't any envy, strife, or division there. there was, that was a Holy Ghost thing. Sunday morning was a Holy Ghost. That wasn't any envy, strife. It's a Holy Ghost thing. It wasn't carnal because we kind of went outside of the camp and we got in the tent. Sunday was a tent meeting. Tonight can be. Praise the Lord. Somebody say amen. Is it fair to say on these few scriptures I've read, is it a fair statement to say that God doesn't want us to be normal? I know you're sleeping. i got to talk fast. God has more for us than just becoming better. God has more for us than just becoming buff. God has more for us than just becoming wealthy. God has more for us than just becoming smart. He wants, I said this one thing, but there's two things. I said, first of all, most Christians have no greater goal than to be normal. That's number one thing I want you to remember. Number two thing, God wants to flood your life with the same power that raised Christ from the dead. My God, that's not normal. He wants you to have fire flying from your fingertips, but you can't be normal. Moses got so fed up with the normal that he went outside the camp. Why? Because he had been in the mountain alone with God. He knew what it was like to be in the presence of God, and he longed for that feeling again. So he pitched a tent, and he said, that's church right there. That's the tent of me. Let's just go out there for a while. That's not normal. You can't hear anything going on in the world. you got to set yourself aside for a period of time. Let's just go out there and worship. God. Worship is not passive. Worship is active. Worship is powerful. God doesn't want you to be normal. He wants you to be Christ-like, and being Christ-like is the furthest from normal that you can get. I may not finish this tonight, but I'm going to move along. We got to redefine our goals. We got to read before God's will to be done in our lives. We have to redefine what normal is. Normal is crazy in the kingdom of God. Normal is you don't fit in. A normal Christian don't fit in. Normal is nuts for God. A child of the king doesn't act like everybody else's kid. We cannot grow if our security comes from circumstances, if our security comes from our job, if our security comes from our education, if our security comes from our looks, if our security comes from our skill, if our security comes from our relationships. Did you say relationships? If our security comes from our relationships, we cannot grow. Our security has got to come from God. Well, my relationships are strong. What if she dies? Hmm. 
I had a great relationship with my grandfather. I miss him. He's gone. I'd love to talk to you, LaPooler, just one more time. I'd have a different conversation. I can't. I, I, I'd love to have a conversation. Just one more conversation with Dina Whitley. I can't. But if that's the only reason that I have security, that's hard preaching, but it's good preaching. What if you get a divorce? How many people have you seen get a divorce and their life just go completely to hell? Because their security was in their relationship with you. My relationship, the only relationship that I have that is secure is the eternal one. Well, I've been married 50 years. The only relationship that you have is the that's secure is the eternal one. So my because my security comes from the Lord. But we're scared to death to go outside the camp. We're scared to death to depend on God. We're scared to death to lean on God. One time, a long time ago, I, I think it was Scott Red when he was just a, a, a kid. Long time ago. I had him walk up on the platform and I, I said, Just I want you to just fall backwards, Scott. I'll catch you. Just fall. I'm right here behind you. Trust me. He he would try to fall, but he would he couldn't make himself fall. He just had to keep catching himself. I said, Now come on, you just gotta fall. You gotta trust me to catch you. What's the Lord doing? He said, Just fall and I'll catch you. Just trust me. But that fear of falling runs deep, and we don't easily trust because we've been beat around some. Anybody in here been beat around any? Why do hungry people stay in dead churches? It's familiar comfortable. We talked this morning, we talked in a meeting a while ago about a, a guest that we had with us a few weeks ago and it is a, a couple, a married couple, and one of the one of the members of that marriage loved church and the other one was scared to death because it was unfamiliar. He was outside, he was in the tent of meeting, he was outside the camp. Oops, I said it was he, it was one of them. How come people stay in bad, abusive relationships? It's their comfort zone. Or they get out of one abusive relationship and they go to another one. Here's an, here's one. How come you still hang around the same idiots you hang around you hung around ten years ago? Because they're comfortable idiots. And can I ask you this question without offending? If you hang around idiots, what are you exactly? <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> because we seek familiarity. I love to go to my mama's house. It's familiar. In 20 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years, I've had a Dallas Cowboys glass in the cabinet at my mama's house since I was 11. Still there. Nobody drinks out of that glass but me. Thanksgiving Day, my brother Danny was drinking out of the Cowboys glass. It hurt my, he had no idea. I'm like, that's my glass. I've been drinking out of that glass since I was 11. You know what happened on Christmas? I went straight to the glass before he got it. It's familiar to me. I go in my room every time I go over there. I just go in my old room, just walk around. I like it. But once in a while, God wants me to go to the tent. 
Am I preaching to anybody? <clears throat> Here's what we do. We work all day. We come home. We watch TV. We, go to, we eat. We go to bed. We get up the next day. We work all day. We come home. We eat, watch TV, and go to bed. Maybe we go to ball practice. Maybe we don't. What? Maybe we go. That's Tuesday. Wednesday, we work all day. We come home, watch TV, go to bed. Thursday, work all day. We'll come home, watch TV, go to bed. Friday, work all day, come home, watch TV, get drunk, go to bed. Saturday, we mow the grass, eat, watch TV, get drunk, go to bed. Sunday, we sleep in, get wake up, eat, go back to bed, watch TV. I'm bored. Just talking about it bores me. But that's the way most people live. If your kid don't make it to the NBA or Major League Baseball or American Idol, you're all bummed out. Honey, newsflash, your kid's probably not going to make it to the Major Leagues. If he does, I hope he comes here and pays ties. But our lifestyle becomes a chain. Our lifestyle becomes bondage, a jail. It may not be sin, but anything that keeps us away from God is sin. Am I preaching to anybody but me? <clears throat> that Moses left the familiar and pitched his tent outside the camp. Let's listen to Abraham, and I'm finished. Here we go. Two quick scriptures, Hebrews. This gives me goosebumps. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered. Whoop, stop right there. Where did Jesus suffer? Outside of his comfort zone. Outside of the familiar. Where was Calvary? It was outside the walls of Jerusalem. I don't know about you, but that's good. When I saw that, it gave me goosebumps. He suffered outside the gate. Verse 13, therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. We got to drink the cup that he drank of, for we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. What the writer of Hebrews say about Abraham, chapter 11? looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Wasn't comfortable living where he lived. He spent his whole life outside the camp. He spent his whole life in a tent. His whole life in a tent. What was he looking for? Relationship. Eternal relationship. He searched for a city whose builder and maker was God. I don't know about you, but that inspires me to do better. Anybody in here, could, you, could anybody in here do a little better? Matthew chapter 6 and 6, and we'll be finished. <clears throat> but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door in your tent outside the camp, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Leave the familiar. Every minute that you spend seeking God is a minute full of new power, new enrichment, new glory, new mercy. How many of you could use new mercy? If I whisper to you, and for you to hear me, you got to get my space. We got to get in God's space because He wants to whisper. He wants to speak to us in the still. He's not often in the thunder and the lightning and the earthquake, but He wants to whisper. But you got to get in His space. We don't want to be up in our personal space. 
But God wants us in his personal space and he wants in our we he wants us to get so close to him that we hear him whisper, but you can't hear him whisper in the camp. It's too busy. Too much hustle and bustle, too much rigmarole. Get outside away. If we're going to become holy, we can't be normal. Holy people are not normal people. Holy people are not people that live their whole life in the same rut. Holy people are not people who pull other people down in the same bucket of misery that they're in. Holy people are not too tired or too busy or too consumed with their hobbies and habits or the temporary things, but they ignore the eternal things. Holy people are people that take some time. That's where holiness begins. If we can talk about it, we can define it. You go to 10 churches, they'll define it 10 different ways. But I'm going to tell you where it starts. Holiness starts when you get out of your rut and you go to the tent for some alone time with God and get so close to him that you can hear him whisper. Let's stand. I don't know if you're deer hunt or not, but alone freezing actually I don't freeze anymore I've decided I take going to my little box blind and I take my little canned heat my little protein bar and I'm all snug as a bug in a rug in there and it's freezing outside I set my boys on those stands that don't have just out in the middle of nowhere freezing to death I go to the warm one get out there and just me and there's nobody around. My cell phone don't work down there. So it's just hours I'm sitting there. We'll do it to deer hunt, but we won't do it to find God. Come on, somebody. And maybe we should just say, you know what? Saturday morning before anybody gets up, I think I'll get up and I think I'll go to the tent for three hours. Or maybe I go down to the church and I'll bow my knee to the creator of the universe or I'll just read his word or I'll just... We just got to because that's where holiness begins. And the Bible says that we should be holy because he is. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Lord, help us to <clears throat> listen, to be convicted and not just listen and not just be moved, <clears throat> but let your word convict us to the point of change. We're tired of just being stirred and moved but not changed, but let your word be an agent of change. Let your word push us, propel us. Let holiness begin in me. Take us out of our comfort zone, out of our familiarity, and let us seek your face. There's a place by you on a rock that we can stand and your glory can pass. But we've got to seek that place. We've got to long for that place. It's got to become more important than the temporary things of this world. So convict our hearts tonight as we seek you. We, all these faithful people in church tonight came on a Wednesday to seek you. Fill that void. We are out of our comfort zone. We are in the tent of meeting. Touch us today as we begin this journey we call holiness. and Teach us <clears throat> your will, your way, your direction. Lead us and guide us into all truth. Let your word be a lamp and a light that in the darkest night would show us the way that we would need to go. And Just bless everybody real good here tonight. And everybody said in Jesus' name.